Hi, and welcome to a Gossip Before Bed. Sip, I have a saucer today because my lovely son got me a cup of tea. For those of you who are new, we wear our jammies and we bring a beverage of our choice and we say sip frequently because that's our thing. Um, I actually got a little chunk of violet crumble with my cup of tea. Oh, now that, that's why I don't have sauces because it goes jingle, 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 jingle. <laughs> so I'll put that down. But I got a little chunk of violet crumble with my cup of tea. A violet crumble's an Australian thing. I think they might be. I can't remember, but they're honeycomb coated in chocolate. And I said to him, no, 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 I'm off the sugar. Take it away. Take it away. But I ended up eating it anyway. Then I had to go and clean my teeth because I'd have chocolates smeared all over my front teeth while I, was, <laughs> while I started recording. But he's made a very nice cup of tea. It's nice and strong. He leaves it on the bench to draw for a very long time. So I'll have one more sip and then we'll get on. Sip. So, so many things to talk about and I enjoyed reading your comments after the last gossip before bed and it was funny the reaction to the story about fairy bread and the sailors because people particularly in the USA were a little confused they were saying I've looked that up and that's a child's dessert or something that you have at birthday parties when you're young and they couldn't work out why I was serving it to sailors <laughs> which that's a completely reasonable sort of question uh, but that was why it was funny you see because it was inappropriate and particularly with beer <laughs> it was very inappropriate my stomach and all their stomachs found it to be highly inappropriate but I love reading your comments it's so funny seeing the reaction to some of the things I say and one lovely lady thank you so much she gave me quite a large tip towards air conditioning <laughs> And she probably took pity on me because I was using Pam Airs to cool myself down. It's not too bad tonight, so it's okay. But thank you very much. That was very, very lovely of you. And it did remind me of talking about tips. It reminded me of a little story. And I thought, oh, I'll tell them this one. This is quite funny. So about 20 years ago, we were booked to sing on a cruise and it was just a nighttime evening cruise and it was on down on the Gold Coast and there's an area of water called the Southport Spit, I believe it's still called that. And these sort of dinner cruises go up and down that waterway and it's lovely. Anyway, a group from Toyota, a group of Japanese businessmen uh, were over for a conference and they'd booked this cruise ship and they had, they were going to have a seafood dinner and fine wine as the sun went down and we were the entertainment. So they boarded the ship and went boarded the ship. It was more a boat, but it was, it was a, it was a posh one, right? It was fairly big. And we were playing sort of suitable cocktail -y, jazzy music, you know, and I would, had the sultry long evening gown on and everything. And it was all very tasteful, very nice. And they were enjoying cocktails and wine and champagne as the sun went down and the boat was slowly cruising and dinner was served and we just kept up the vibe and then the plan was that after dinner we were supposed to crank it up a bit into some dance music but the awkward thing was that it was about 70 just men there was <laughs> only men on board so it was sort of um, not strained, but we were wondering how it was really going to work. We didn't know whether, you know, the men would want to get up to dance. But we were saved because their organiser translator came up to us soon after the dinner service had finished and said, look, um, there's a karaoke machine on board and all of them want to sing karaoke. Would you mind taking a break? And we said, no, that's fine. What a fabulous idea. We were so relieved. Anyway, we were sort of just stepping back from our gear and sort of turning off the microphones and all this sort of thing. And one of the gentlemen um, came up to me and he tried to press money into my hand and he was sort of bowing and everything. And I was a bit confused. 
And it was quite a large tip. And I said to him, oh, no, 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 that's not necessary. That's fine, you know, because I cottoned on that he was apologising about the karaoke, you see. We weren't insulted. We were actually relieved. So that was fine. I said, no, no, it's fine. You know, I didn't accept his tip. Anyway, soon after that, another gentleman comes up and tries to press money into my hand. And, and it was, you know, Australians, particularly back then, weren't really used to tips. Tips didn't really happen back about 20 years ago. It was a rare thing. I know in the USA it's, you know, just so normal to accept tips, but it was a bit rarer back then. And I said, oh, no, 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 you know, I thought it was sort of bad taste and rude to take money off these people. <laughs> so that was fine. And then the translator organiser came up to me and said, you must take the money because they're feeling insulted and they're feeling that you're insulted and that's why you're knocking back the money, you see. And she said, until you accept the money, they're going to keep coming up. So I thought, oh, oh, okay, it's sort of a cultural thing. I've, I've misinterpreted the whole thing. So the next one that came up, I accepted it and that's okay. And then we went sort of a little further away from our gear and there was this sort of window seat on the boat and we prepared to just sit down a little off to one side with our gear so that when they wanted us to play again that we would be ready and on call sort of thing. Well, then another gentleman comes up and presses money into my hand. So I did what the translator organiser told me to do and she was sort of glaring at me like, take it, take it. So I took it and thanked them very much and gave a little bow. Well, this went on and on and on. <laughs> anyway, it got to about $750. Now, back then, 20 years ago, $750 was quite a bit of loot. Now, I started to get a little bit embarrassed as much as I loved it. <laughs> and I said to my husband, look, we should go up, you know, up on the top deck and sort of make ourselves scarce because this is not stopping and accepting it is, you know, which was, it was fabulous. So anyway, we went up the little steps onto the top deck. That's fine. And then the translator organiser came up to us and I thought, oh, no, she's going to want all the money back because I've done the wrong thing. I've <laughs> accepted too many tips. I didn't know. Anyway, she said they would like you to have dinner and relax. I, I, oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. They, they organised for dinner to be served to us. And they set up a dining table up on the top deck. We were the only ones up on the top deck beautiful white tablecloth, a lovely seafood selection was brought out for us and an ice bucket with a bottle of wine, two glasses. And so we were sitting there on the top deck cruising along on the water and sipping fine wine and eating fabulous fresh seafood with $750 in our pocket. Plus we were going to get paid for the gig. <laughs> We didn't have to work. And I remember just looking at my husband and saying cheers and saying, it doesn't get much better than this. <laughs> and it didn't. Now, to balance that, over the next few weeks, I'll tell you a few stories about horror jobs we had, because believe me, there were real horror jobs. There was even jobs we had to do, which I think were pretty much for mafia types. So um, I've got a few more juicy stories to tell. Don't worry. And it wasn't always glamorous for sure. I've got to go sip. I feel like I'm going to cough. I'm going to cut the video now and cough. Be back in a sec. I'm back. I hate coughing on camera. <laughs> sip. That's the thing about COVID, you get over it and then all of a sudden you'll get another symptom. I even took another test because I thought, oh no, it's come back because I kept getting cough and breathless and oh gosh, it just sort of rumbles on and strange neck pain and our dog got it. Did you know that your dog can catch COVID? Our poor little, poor little one got COVID and it sort of made him throw up and and the other end, and he was really lethargic. And so we took him to the vet and this was over four or five days. We took him to the vet before four or five days, but in all, he was sick for about four or five days. And the vet said, oh yes, dogs can catch COVID. And here we are all infectious, cuddling him, 
And he was making the most of it because we were all home and we were all <laughs> laid out and so we we're all cuddling him and everything. And we gave him COVID, but he's fine now. He's over it now, which is good. Really good to see. Okay, so Super Bowl. All right. Now, Travis Kelsey. I know nothing about American football. It's NFL, isn't it? Okay. But I've got to say, I was pretty shocked to see that footage of Travis Kelsey actually pushing his coach. I think his name was Andy. And I want all the people from the USA to explain to me, is that an overreaction? <laughs> because to me, like we have like Aussie rules, right? I have a feeling that if one of our players did that in a grand final, uh, pushed a coach, I don't think they'd play again in a hurry. I think that they would be hauled up and they would be suspended. And so the first games of the next season, they wouldn't be playing. Um, and I just think that the whole crowd would have booed in Australia. And I don't think, and I think, you know, the, the media in Australia would completely just can a footballer who pushed their coach or, or yelled in the face of their coach. We sort of have a big thing about, well, it's just respect, isn't it? I mean, you just wouldn't ever, ever dare to do that to a coach. I don't think. All the Aussies out there, tell me, am I overstating it or do you think that that's pretty accurate? And I'm not putting anyone down. I mean, this can be different cultures. You see, in different sports and different cultures, different things apply. And with sort of American football, that might be perfectly commonplace and fine. And it appears to be because no one's really talking about it. It's sort of just like, oh, well, yes, he had a you know, he had a moment and no one's really making him pay for that moment. In Australia, we really make you pay for your moments. <laughs> I, I was shocked. And then I even went sort of really overstating it and really reacting to it and thinking, oh, dear, you know, is this a red flag, Taylor? Is this is this really the guy you want to marry and have babies with? Because is it a red flag? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I mean, in Australia, there's lots of sort of, um, you know, what do they call it? You know, in cricket, we're slagging off and, you know, trying to get the other side upset and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, in Aussie rules football, there's lots of <laughs> biffo and, you know, behind the scenes when the, when the umpires aren't looking and it's a pretty tough sport. But it's just the actual thing to the coach. Anyway, anyway, don't really understand. Then on to Taylor Swift's smooch at the end of the game. And I've got to say, even though I don't follow that game, it was a pretty exciting ending. And it was pretty exciting that they won in the last moments of the game. That was really exciting. And I tuned into the halftime show because I always do. And I really enjoyed that. Love, Dasha. Thought that was fabulous. But the only thing that I thought let them down a bit was the old Super Bowl commercials this year. I didn't think they were funny. Now, usually they're really, really funny, aren't they? And quite often in previous Super Bowls, I've looked at sort of a, a reel of Super Bowl ads and I've laughed out loud they've been that funny. And... I remember one year they had Betty White. Do you remember the year they had Betty White? I laughed out loud at that. I thought it was hilarious. But the Jennifer Aniston, David Schwimmer one, oh, I just, I thought the storyline was confusing that she could only remember so many things at once and she only had so many things in her shopping and you can only remember five things. So therefore, when she bumps into David Schwimmer, she didn't remember, oh, and I like Jennifer Aniston. I really like her. But no, I just think the script wasn't that good. And everybody was sort of carrying on about Jennifer Aniston. What had she done to her face and everything? I thought she looked fantastic. I mean, if I looked that fantastic, I'd be thrilled. I thought she looked great. I didn't think her face looked funny or anything. I just thought that she looked you know, like a 50-something woman who was in great shape. 
Um, she had a fair bit of makeup on, but I didn't really notice anything weird looking about her face. Leave, <laughs> leave your comments down below if you think that, you know, there was anything untoward there, but I thought, I thought she looked quite good. I've got some notes here too. So I've covered the Super Bowl. Oh, I thought Kinsey Schofield was really cute after the Super Bowl because she was on quite a few shows and they were asking her about the Super Bowl and she's obviously a Swifty. And she said, oh, that kiss. Oh, I was, it was the smooch of the century. And she, she was so impressed with that kiss. She's gorgeous. I love her. I think she's wonderful. I love Kinsey Schofield. She's just such a such a sweetie, isn't she? She's just got such a lovely manner about her. I really enjoy her whenever she gets interviewed on any of the shows. And she seems to be on just about every show lately, commenting on Harry and Meghan and the King and Catherine and everybody. Uh, what else have I got here? Um, oh, this is a bit obscure. <laughs> In my desperation to not talk about you know who and because I just can't stand it like you you're probably just so exhausted so we won't talk about the TLB okay or Rachel but I've written here in my desperation to find things to talk about that have nothing to do with them <laughs> I've said here WA which is Western Australia in Australia has banned ham and cheese sandwiches. Now, I should give you some context for that, but they were saying that in school canteens in WA, they have now made the humble ham and cheese toasty on the red list. So kids can only have it, I think, about once a fortnight or something. And also on the red list are sausage rolls and pies and all those other things that are bad for you. But the ham and cheese toasty? I mean, that's a staple. <laughs> That's, that's something, that's comfort food, that's good. Have a ham and cheese toasty and an apple and you've had a good rounded lunch. <laughs> I know it's not good for you, but oh gee, I feel sorry for kids these days. They're missing out a bit, aren't they? I remember when I was at school, it was very rare for me to be able to get the canteen. It was a special, special treat. My mother always packed me healthy, lovely lunches. But on the rare occasion where I could actually get the canteen, I used to always, always order a pie. And the canteen was up in the senior school and I was down in the junior school and a big box of hot pies, you know, the orders all in paper bags used to come down to the junior school and we'd all have to wait in the dining room and then the teachers would give out our order and call your last name, your surname. Well, I always used to get my mum to pack a teaspoon in my lunch because I liked to take the lid off the pie eat all the filling with my teaspoon. God, I must have been an insufferable child. <laughs> this sounds really pedantic, doesn't it? And then I would eat the shell of the pie, still with the gray, bit of gravy in it, and then I last thing, I would eat the lid <laughs> before I ran out to play because we had to finish our pies and things before we were allowed to go out to play. Well, that's fine. So, you know, I'm just so looking forward to this pie. I've been looking forward to it all morning. It was just all I could think about was this pie. And I still remember I took the lid off and I looked in absolute horror because inside it was green. Now, don't be worried and don't feel sick. There was nothing wrong with the pie. It was a beautiful pie but it was a curry pie and it was a curry pie made with probably just curry powder and it looked green <laughs> and I was so upset and I was very fussy about my food and I couldn't eat it because it looked different and I remember that this is what a wussy child I was I started crying into the green pie <laughs> Because and I remember a teacher coming up trying to encourage me to try it because it's good to try new things. <laughs> no, couldn't do it, couldn't do it. So I think I ended up giving away the pie. <laughs> and I've never forgotten the trauma of the green curry pie. Oh, no, because that was actually, I had a worse trauma than that. My mother used to make lasagna 
And I adored her lasagna. I adored it. And again, I was looking forward to it. This is another tragic story. Anyway, one night she decided to make the lasagna with spinach lasagna. So it was green, wasn't it? See, I have a thing about green things. <laughs> and again, I was really hungry and I was really looking forward to it. And it was green. And again, I didn't sob into my green lasagna, but, you know, a, a slight watering of the eyes because I was hungry. And then my sister and my brother were trying to convince me that it tastes the same, which of course it does. But did I believe them? No. I just sat there soulfully looking at this lasagna that I couldn't, couldn't eat because it was green. And of course, my mother was very sensible and thought I was being an idiot. So she just said, eat it, it tastes exactly the same. And she thought that my hunger would overcome me, but it didn't. And I, I don't think I got dessert that night because if you didn't eat your main meal, you didn't get dessert because obviously you weren't hungry. So I think I suffered watching my brother and sister have ice cream. See, mum, I'm scarred from the green lasagna incident. <laughs> it's all your fault. It's like Harry's sausage. <laughs> <laughs> Sip. Let's see what else I have written down here. Oh, it's just enthralling, isn't it? <laughs> Green curry pie and lasagna and ham and cheese sandwiches. What else? Oh, no, this is actually quite interesting. I saw an interview with Wayne Sleep, and do you remember he did that dance with Diana and it was in Convent Garden at the Royal Opera House, I believe, and she did that dance with him and came out from the wings and no one expected it and they had like 10 curtain calls and a standing ovation and it was portrayed in The Crown, wasn't it? And evidently uh, the poor then Prince Charles was not impressed and he was a little bit embarrassed. I'm wondering whether um, he was a little bit embarrassed due to Diana's costume because I've actually got a huge, beautiful book and there's these giant blown up photographs of Diana doing that dance and she was basically just wearing a negligee you know a, a slip it was elegant it was beautiful and she looked gorgeous and it was something suitable for a you know a ballet performance but it was pretty sexy I've got to say so I'm wondering whether that was the problem that he was worried that it was you know conduct unbecoming for a royal now we see the conduct unbecoming that's happening <laughs> with a lot of things that seems quite mild in comparison doesn't it but I that's one of those incidences that I wish I wish I had have been there because I think that would have been quite marvelous to see and I think the atmosphere in the actual Opera House would have been amazing. Isn't it amazing when you go to see any show and there's a standing ovation? It just is electrifying, isn't it? When everyone stands up at the end of a musical performance and just, you know, standing ovation and yelling out bravo and they just, the clapping doesn't stop and you can see the joy on the cast's faces and they're, they're coming back out and they're coming back out and they can't believe their luck. They can't believe that it's not ending. And you just, you just bounce out of the theatre, don't you? Like, I don't know, it's just, I think you capture the energy of everybody else that is actually in the theatre. I think you take a bit of that energy and you suck it in and you get to take it home and you just don't want it to end. Or you just don't want that, that vibe to ever leave you. Yes, that's the magic of a live show for sure. And he actually said in this interview that it led to a 10-year friendship with Diana. It wasn't just the one night and the dance. They evidently met up quite a few times over the next 10 years and it was quite a genuine, genuine friendship. So that was very interesting. Oh, and I'll probably finish off this gossip before bed. Gee, I'm doing a good job. I'm not talking about the TLB or you know who. Are you noticing? Are you noticing? I hope you've all had a good week. It has been exhausting, hasn't it? There's been so much thrown at us and just such a huge barrage and I've been making all these videos and I'm just, I'm, I'm over my outrage now. I can't. 
<laughs> I can't do any more outrage. But I do have something else in real life that I can manage to be outraged about. So we'll have a sip, sip. Well, this is my big whingy outrage. My mum needed some $50 notes for birthday parties. Uh, not birthday parties, birthday cards, you know, for grandkids and stuff. So I offered to go and get it out of the ATM. So off I toddle to the ATM and I get out the required amount, but it spits out in 20s, doesn't it? And there was no option on the ATM to actually specify the notes. So I thought, that's okay, I've got to go over to another area, another part of a shopping centre, so I'll go into my bank and I'll just swap it over for $50 notes. Well, I haven't been in a real bank. I've just been to ATMs. I haven't been to a real bank, I would say, for over two, three years. I haven't been in one. So... I went in a real bank. I got the shock of my life. When did they turn out to have no tellers? When did that happen? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. There's no one there. There was just a guy to greet me as I walked in the door and then there was a little sort of shelf, a white shelf, and he asked me what I was there for and I said, oh, I just want to swap these 20s over into $50 notes. And he goes, do you have an account with us? And I said, yes. Well, so-and-so, I can't remember her name. Let's call her Lorraine. Lorraine will be back in five minutes. Oh, okay. So I waited at the little white bench. It did have a safety glass thing if they got, you know, armed robbery or something, but it was just this sort of really thin little thing. And then Lorraine came out from behind where the vault was. <laughs> and she looked a rather stern one and she looked quite shocked that there was a customer there. And she said... Can I help you? And I said, oh, I just want to transfer these 20s into $50 notes, please. Do you have an account with us? Yes, I do. Show me, well, can I see your card? And I said, oh, I've only got my husband's card, but I also, it's a joint account and I, you know, we're in this bank and blah, 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 blah. Oh, well, I can't, that, that card's in his name. And I said, oh, look, I've just been to your ATM and got out some 50s because on their ATM you can specify it. And she said, but I said, I was over at another ATM. Here I am explaining myself to this one staff member in the bank. And then I said, and I went over the other ATM and $20 and that's why I'm here. She said, well, we've got nothing to do with that ATM. And I said, yes, I know that. But, and then I went through the whole explanation again and I'm feeling angrier and tenser and more and more irritable. But having used to work in customer service, I don't lose the plot. I keep it nice because, you know, everyone, you don't want everyone to have a bad day. So <laughs> I was like <laughs> seething inside. Anyway, she very disapprovingly finally agreed to swap my 20s over to bloody 50s but this I'm not kidding I'm not kidding now I don't know whether she was doing this deliberately but she went into the system and she went clickety clackety clickety clackety clickety clackety and then she looked at my 20s on the bench clickety clackety clickety clackety clickety clackety then she looked at me clickety clackety clickety I am not kidding. I am not exaggerating. And then she looked at the screen and I thought, is she doing her end of day banking? Like, is she doing, is she doing my transaction or is she just making me wait? This went on and on and on. And I said, gee, it's sure taking a long time. This must be quite a difficult transaction. And she just looked at me over her glasses. <laughs> and then eventually I heard this whir and then... 50s came out and I got my 50s. But it, it was a weird experience. And I am not kidding. About three years ago, I'd gone into the same bank and there was at least six tellers behind windows, a manager in a little off sort of office area and another investment guy sort of drumming up business over in a sort of high bench area with pamphlets everywhere so there's all that stuff and now we're down to this caretaker guy who accosts you as you walk in the door and Lorraine so <laughs> with that and the supermarket checkouts I'm feeling really out of touch 
and really old. And I just feel like such a funny daddy. I just seem to be so behind the eight ball here. Has anyone else experienced anything similar or do you just take all this in your stride? And the other thing I find extraordinary is that all these things don't make our life better. It's not service. It's a hassle. Everything is hard now. You can't change money over. You can't get money out. You can't do anything. You can't deal with anyone who's happy to see you either in the supermarket or the bank or anywhere. Like it's, it's really awkward. Oh, oh, and I went to the doctors and I had to, oh, I suppose this is a bit gross. I don't really know if I want to tell this story. Oh, look, I'll just tell it anyway because it's quite funny. I had to give a sample. <laughs> oh, anyway, oh, this, is, this is really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Maybe I would be better off talking about happy American <laughs> rather than my samples. <laughs> I had to cut there because I had another coughing fit. I'm so sorry. Sip, I can't laugh because it makes me cough. Right. Okay. So we're back. So <laughs> back to the sample. Anyway, I went off because I had to do this, right? Now, the doctor was knocking off in three quarts of an hour. And I really wanted to get this to her because I wanted antibiotics, if you get my meaning. So I go off and you've got to, there's no lose at the doctor. So I had to go off into the shopping center once, right? With my little bottle. <laughs> anyway, go in wasn't successful got got fright couldn't couldn't do anything right so I thought oh no I know oh no and I was panicking because the doctor's leaving in three quarters of an hour and I really wanted these antibiotics for obvious reasons right so I thought okay I'll go and get a bottle of water from the fruit place and I'll I'll chug that and then I'll be fine so <laughs> run back to the fruit place pop into the doctor say to the receptionist unnecessarily oh I'm just going to go and get a bottle of water because what time does doctor you know who leave oh yeah yeah okay okay I've got I've still got half an hour because I've got to get this back in there and the receptionist I'm not kidding is just looking at me like this so that was highly embarrassing so then I run out get the bottle of water and I run back run back run back chugging it chugging it chugging it as I go chugging it chugging it chugging it go in dribble That's it. Okay. I know this is gross, but it was very embarrassing. It was quite funny. So anyway, <laughs> it was like the Sahara Desert. Get my get the picture. But there was there was a tiny little dribble of an oasis in there. So <laughs> I back to the doctors and I said, Is Doctor still there? Oh, I'm good. Oh yeah. And, and, and I had it covered, luckily. And the receptionist says, I'll tell doctor you've come back. <laughs> anyway, the doctor calls me in and I showed her my effort and she just burst out laughing. <laughs> and she said, I don't think there's enough to test, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> anyway, I got my antibiotics because it tested that I needed them. So... <laughs> Oh, what a drama. What a drama. Okay. But don't you think that's a lot of pressure to be told that you have to come up with something and that the doctor's leaving in three quarters of an hour? Don't you find that stressful? <laughs> it's not. You can't perform under pressure. Well, I can't perform under pressure anyway. Now, just before I go after yet another awful story, um, I have to say that I am thinking that this might be great for our next book, Kitty Kelly, The Royals, because it's quite lighthearted. It's got a lot of juice in it and it's very entertaining. And I find myself sort of giggling and really enjoying and really like, oh, oh, with this. And I know a lot of royal stories and I know a lot of royal goss. So if you can get that reaction out of me, I think it might get that reaction out of you. And even if you read it ages ago when it first came out, I think it may remind you of a few key things. So what do you think? Leave your comments down below because I'm really keen on this 
rather than Lady C's The Royal Marriages. The Royal Marriages is a very good book, but it is um, it has a lot of historical content and it's rather, um, it's more of a serious work. It's more of a serious work. Whereas this is very well researched and it is a serious work, but we could also have some fun with it. So let me know what you think down below because I'm pretty keen. I'm pretty keen. And if you all agree, I'll start recording that sort of alongside Housekeeper's Diary because we're nearly at the end of Housekeeper's Diary. We haven't got many chapters to go. So I'll sort of start kicking this one in, okay, to take over. So I think that's all my notes. I think I've sort of gas bagged on for long enough <laughs> about nothing. And I'll look forward to seeing you again next week. So before we go, we'll have a final sip. Hello to all the new subscribers. Let's go sip together to all the new subscribers. Sip. A few of you were excited saying that I might get to 50,000 and I was hoping that I would get to 50,000 before a Gossip Before Bed this week but it's well I'm not because I always have to record this a little bit earlier because I've got to allow time for YouTube to actually upload so I didn't make it this week but maybe next week I will and everyone's saying to me, oh, you've got to sip some bubbles if you get to 50,000. So I will. I'll have a glass of bubbles with you if we get to 50,000. So let's see if we can do it. I can't believe it. I mean, that would just be beyond the realms of anything I ever thought would actually happen. So that would be just so exciting. I can't believe how big this community is growing. And yet it seems to retain its loveliness and it seems to retain all the great relationships. Just before I go, the premiere of A Housekeeper's Diary the other night on Monday night, it was a hoot because there's often, probably because the time sort of suits certain people, but often you see familiar faces in the live chat for the premieres and they are just so lovely and they chat away and it's just such a great community. It's so friendly and welcoming. So if you're new here, don't hold back from commenting and chatting to everyone here because, you know, lovely bunch. Couldn't get a better bunch anywhere, I don't think. So thanks a lot for joining me. Can't wait to see you again really soon. Big kiss. Bye.